Hello and welcome everyone who's here in the room joining us today and also everybody watching online. I'm not sure what camera to look into, so I'm just going to look vaguely around, mm. but hello to everyone. This is the launch event of HistFest 2024. I was trying to do the maths. It's not five years since the first festival, but it's five festivals since mm. the first one. So I think that's kind of a landmark, but yeah. welcome to everyone anyway. Yeah. Um, I've just got some housekeeping to make you aware of before we get started. So firstly, for people watching at home, if you have any questions that you want to put to Bethany, preferably related to the Seven Wonders, <laughs> um, you can do so by using the question box. Um, and I can, I can pick it up on this little tablet here and I can ask your question to Bethany towards the end. If you're in the audience, you can do the usual thing of raising your hand and we have a roaming mic that will be coming round to, um, to, uh, to you to answer your question, uh, for you to ask your questions. Um, the other thing to let you make you aware of if you're watching from home is that you can enable the captioning on the screen if you need to. And book-wise, we have a bookseller outside if you're here in person and you can get your book signed by Bethany. She'll be doing a book signing afterwards. If you're watching online, you can also... Uh, purchase signed copies. Bethany will be signing them after after this event, so they'll be available to purchase. Or you could just purchase a copy anyway mm -hmm. and maybe bring it to the next Bethany event. Yeah. Seven wonders. <laughs> so I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. So welcome. Um, with it being the not quite fifth, but almost fifth yeah. festival, yeah. what better way to start it than with Bethany Hughes? So Bethany is an award-winning historian, author, broadcaster whose books have been translated into many languages. She's made documentaries for the BBC, Channel 4, PBS, National Geographic, ABC, and um, the Discovery and History channels as well. She's a professor, she's been a professor at the New College of Humanities and a research fellow at King's College London and has been honoured with numerous awards over, over, the, over time. Um, but this will be Bethany's first, uh, sorry, third outing with HistFest, mm. and the reason for that, and it's because she's such a wonderful speaker. Mm. She brings to life the ancient world with so much wit and passion and warmth. Um, she first headlined in 2018, speaking about her book, Istanbul, um, and then returned in 2023 to guide us through the history of Venus and Aphrodite. And we're delighted that she's here today to celebrate the release of her brand new book, well, not quite brand new, actually, mm. January new yeah. book, and Sunday Times best-selling book, Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. So thank you, Bethany. Aww, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we could, this is a complete mutual loving. Could, we should just do, <laughs> also do a shout out. So Rebecca, you know, pretty much single-handedly started HistFest. I know that you have an amazing team and lots of supporters and colleagues, but you powered it through. When would you say it was 2018? Late 2018. Late 2018. Yes. I know. So just kudos to you because we all love history, but you need people who are practical enough to help people experience history. So well done. And thank, thank you. you practical is the best compliment I've yeah. ever had. It really <laughs> but um, let's, let's turn Turn back time, let's go right back to, um, no, we're not going right back to the ancient world yet. First of all, I want to know why, why you decided to write this book about the seven wonders. Uh, I, well, that's a good question. I think there's probably an emotional answer and a kind of uh, purist academic answer. And the emotional answer is because the one thing that I see when you look through history, right back into, into deep history, so, in, so into prehistory, so sort of 10, 20, 40, 50,000 years ago, what I see is that in good times and in bad, as a species, we need to wonder. We, we crave the act of wondering and awe and amazement. And I think that's for lots of different reasons. Mm -hmm. There's a very positive reason for that, that, that we're a hyper-social species, and if we wonder at something, then it's a, it's a collective experience. It draws us together. I think we're compelled, even though we, we, you know, it feels like we're living in a quite unwonderful world at the moment, but as you know, the past was very unwonderful a lot of the time, and creating a wonder proved that you could join together to achieve beyond the potential of the individual by collaborating and just kind of privilege 
beauty and ambition and all of those things. So, so I sort of really felt that wonder matters and analysing why we wonder matters. So, so that, was, that was the emotional reason. And then there's the kind of um, very uh, you know, academic one, that there is a tonne of new amazing archaeology, some of which I'll be sharing tonight, about these, about these wonders. And I just thought, you know, we've got to try to, to pin them down because I think when you say wonder and you say the seven wonders, sometimes people think it's a kind of fantasy list, that these are made up, they're legendary, you know, they're almost kind of fairy tale like scattered across the globe. But these are real places built by real women and, and real men. So I wanted to, to tether them with the new archaeology. And, and more than that, they, they are extraordinary constructions, these. So I started off when I was writing um, uh, this, this originally, sort of thinking, oh, you know, I'm sure I could think of my own my own seven. Th this is a pretty good seven to choose because they are just so exceptional. But they also, they're more than just buildings. So they tell us something really pertinent about the preoccupations of the age. They tell us about the kind of um, the journey of time and what matters at different stages um, in humanity's history. And I think that they all tell us something about us today as well. So, so yeah, so I kind of, I, you know, I, I dived into it and, and I've enjoyed every, every second. It's been quite lively, the research. I've been in some <laughs> quite, quite uh, you know... Uh, exciting places, shall we say? But um, but yeah, no, it's 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 been fantastic to do. No, it's it's wonder <laughs> It's a, such a wonderful book, and like the prose aside and the history aside, buy this book just for the timeline at the beginning alone because <laughs> it's expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to throw a question out to the audience ah. now. I'm going to put you all on the spot. Is there anyone brave enough to name the seven wonders, <gasps> or at least attempt to? <laughs> Raise oh. your hands. There's a there's a prize in it for oh. you. Oh, we have someone at the back there, a the gentleman in the middle. Yeah, you, now looking round. <laughs> we don't have a spotlight here, but <laughs> if we did, it would be on you. Can we get a mic to the, the gentleman in the middle over there? Uh -huh. Oh, you are brave. I have to tell you, because even I spent 10 years writing this and I still have to do it chronologically. So I'm kind of make sure I don't you miss one back. out. Yeah. <clears throat> where are you? Is it here? <laughs> It's a big build-up now. Yeah, no. <laughs> Bethany's going to be the judge of whether you're close you... enough to deserve the prize. Are you reading my book on your lap? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've had time to think now. Um, so there's the the pyramid on the cover. Yeah. Is one. There's the lighthouse of Alexandria. Yeah. There's the uh, Colossus of Rhodes. Yeah. The mausoleum. Very good. Hanging Gardens of Babylon? Yeah. How many is that? Five. <laughs> uh, and there's the Temple of Artemis somewhere yeah. in Turkey. Yeah. And is it a statue, statue of Zeus? Yeah! Oh, brilliant! <laughs> This very book will be yours. It's signed as well. So at oh. the end, if you come down, you have, you have won a oh. copy. Congratulations. Congratulations. That's fantastic. <laughs> so, shall we turn to the wonders themselves? Yeah. So I'm yeah. going to ask you what is a wonder, but then yeah. also where are these wonders? Yes. Well, they, so now they've been named so beautifully. So let's look at, look at the where, because... As we were saying, it's really interesting when you talk to people, I think um, a lot of people imagine, as I said, that they're made up, that they're mythological. So just the first thing to say is they are all real places um, that were visited by real women and real men. And that's something that's really important to remember about them, that this Seven Wonders list wasn't just a kind of random list, it was almost a bucket list. So these were places that mattered to antiquity and that were you could physically visit. So if you if you have you know have a look, kind of starting in the west and moving east, so the Statue of Zeus, Olympia, Temple of Artemis, Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, Colossus of Rhodes, the slight outlier, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Pharos Lighthouse of Alexandria, and the Great Pyramid of Giza. And if you look at that map, you can kind of see, obviously, they all ring the Mediterranean. So you can imagine that it was physically possible for people to go to, to um, see them. And 
it, it wasn't just the great and the good who visited. We know that lots of people did this almost kind of uh, pilgrimage, rather kind of beautiful sort of humanist pilgrimage to these cultural wonders. So um, they are all exceptional buildings. It, this is a list, and I hate saying it, so this is a list where size matters <laughs> because they are all enormous. I mean, they are extraordinarily huge. And I do think when they were being made, there must have been these sort of ancient equivalent of, you know, council planning committee <laughs> rooms with people going, hang on a second, you want to build a bronze statue that's 108 foot high? You are mad. It will never, it will never work. Or, you know, a pyramid, a giant tomb that's over 460 feet high. It won't catch on. You're crazy. So they're really audacious. They're really audacious impositions on our, on our planet. And they span a huge time span as well. So if you think the earliest one, the Great Pyramid of Giza stretches back at least 4,500 years. And then you have the uh, Lighthouse of Alexandria built around 2,300 years ago. So they, they, there's over 2,000 years between them. But they have a kind of cohesion so, so that they, they, are, they are perfect when listed together. And they're part of the same connected world. But I just, I, I wonder if you could detail a little bit why the number seven is so significant and important. Yeah, and it's really interesting, isn't it? So, so the list, so the, the earliest extant um, example that we have of this Seven Wonders list um, is around 2,300 years old. Um, it's a fragment of papyrus that was used to mummify a body in central Egypt um, on the banks of the River Nile. And it's a, from a thing called the Latakuli Alexandrini. And because it was used to mummify a body, you know, it's pretty fragmentary. But what's really fascinating about it is that the Latakuli Alexandrini, and the clues in the title, so it was almost certainly written in the, in the city of Alexandria, it's not just a list of the seven wonders of the ancient world, it's a list of lists. So it lists the seven tallest mountains, the seven best springs, the seven finest generals, the seven finest artists. And it's really significant that for two reasons. So one is this comes from the Hellenistic age. So this is the time after Alexander the Great. So the Hellenistic age is loosely <coughs> between the death of Alexander the Great and the death of, of Queen Cleopatra, the last great pharaoh. And this was a time that loved a list. They really <laughs> liked a rational approach. So you've had these rather wafty, wonderful Greeks that I adore, who, you know, men like Socrates, who just ask these open-ended questions the whole time. And Socrates famously said, you know, there's no point cataloguing the world. We need to comprehend it. But come the Hellenistic age, they go... This is with the influence of Aristotle, who is Alexander the Great's tutor. No, 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 no. We really need a taxonomy of, uh, of the world. We need to understand it, particularly with rational lists. Because if you think about it, a list is irrational. But if we write a list, somehow it makes sense. It sort yes. of feels like it's a, it's a group that has cohesion. And I'm a great list writer um, because it makes you feel as if you're in control of the chaos of the world. So even if you don't you know, act on anything that you've listed, it sort of makes you feel in charge. So lists really mattered. They were a really important part of the psyche of the Hellenistic age. And the number seven is completely um, <coughs> significant. So I love the Greeks. Um, but they invent the word history and they're very good at writing themselves into it. So the ancient Greeks will say, we invented this notion of the seven, seven wonders, but actually that goes right back to the Near East and the Middle East. So in Mesopotamian culture, the number seven was also really significant. And for the ancients, this was um, a special magic number. So they thought that it combined the, all the elements of the earth, so earth, air, wind, and fire, and the elements of the heavens, so the sun, the moon, and the stars. And together with the, the, the three and four combined, the whole of the cosmos, the whole of the universe, everything that mattered was contained. So it was a number that was thought to be kind of capacious and to signify everything that mattered. Um, I've had a fantastic time talking about this book since it's come out um, and I, I asking the audience again why the number seven is significant. Are there any mathematicians in the room? You're going to keep quiet now. Well, you might win a book if you put your hand up. Um, are there any mathematicians? No. Well, sometimes there are. And seven is a very special number mathematically as well. Obviously, it's a prime number. 
And there was a brilliant, brilliant mathematician in the room. He said, oh, you know, it's a really great number because of the way that you can multiply. And he said, like, I'll send you a YouTube video and it, it will explain it all. And I watched it that night and thought, I have no <laughs> idea what's going on. It's just like bigger and bigger and bigger sums. But apparently it is a very potent number mathematically. And then um, something else that somebody said to me since I've written the book is that the, a seven-sided shape is the only shape that you can't create with a compass and a flat rule. So for those ancients who used compasses and flat rules, perhaps they thought this had some sort of, you know, divine, it was something that had somehow come from the heavens. So, so seven is a really, really significant number and it's used to prove that the list itself is significant. It has this kind of sim symbolic power. Um, and just to kind of complete aside, when... Um, I was, I was speaking in uh, Wales about the book, and this lovely gentleman came up to me, much a sort of older gentleman, um, who I, 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 you know, he, he told me he was a farmer, and he said he was he was a very positive person, and he'd had a terrible time through lockdown, and had got incredibly depressed to, to, to the point of feeling suicidal. And he said the only thing that kept him going was at night lying in bed and making lists of seven beautiful things, seven positive things, so seven trees or flowers or, and, and he said he had no idea why he was doing, you know, putting it into this sort of rhythm of seven. So, so, so it's just fascinating that. So it is a number, we give it its own significance, but I think as, as a number, it is, it is a rather, you know, it's, it's beautiful kind of math, math, mathematically and, and psychologically too. That's a really, really lovely story. Sh mm. Shall we, shall we go back to the first? Yes. Order? The first wonder of your book. Yes, yes, we should. And you're very good to keep time. Because I have to say, the first time I did a talk at the British Museum, I got to the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and realised, ooh, got two minutes left. So, you know, <laughs> kind of... <laughs> try and get through all this. Rain me, rain me in. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely. So yeah, let's, let's look at the, at the, at the, the you know, the, the oldest um, wonder, the Great Pyramid of Giza. In some lists, it's the Great Pyramids of Giza that are listed. Which, you know, how many people have been to it? How many people have seen the... What a room. Wow. Yeah, so well over, well over half. Well, I don't know if you agree, but I can never not be completely overawed um, when I stand in the presence of the Great Pyramid. Um, you know, it is the most extraordinary thing. So, you know, you'll all know this. It's, it's built of 2.3 million limestone blocks. It's the heaviest building still ever created by human hand. It's the oldest of all of the wonders, and yet it's the only one that, can st that still stands pretty much um, intact. So its engineering is incredible. And, um, you know, you do think, what are we making now? that's still going to be <laughs> standing in 4,600 years' time. I can't think of anything. I mean, I... I somebody, this, this book. That this book, book, yeah, in the, living in the imagination. <laughs> somebody said maybe the Hadron Collider was... Oh, yeah. Maybe, you know, it's built. But, but um, you know, it is, it is a, an exquisite um, thing. And it's still revealing its secrets. And this is, this is what, I, what I love about it. So just for a start, you know, up, if I'd been talking to you four months ago, I'd have said it's... 4,500 years old. We now know it's 4,600 years old because of some of the new archaeology on the Giza on the Giza plateau. So it's it's constantly, you know, it's incredible that it's been there for all of that time, and yet we're still discovering so much about it. So what? I mean, I know a lot of people will will know this already, but just for people that don't like myself, perhaps, um, why was it built? Why was it constructed? Yeah. And um, what was the world in which it was constructed like? And what? What did it mean to the people at the time, or one person? Well, yeah, one particular. <laughs> well, so I'm just going to put it out there and say it wasn't built by aliens. So, you know, what? it was, <laughs> I know, extraordinary. I know it's controversial no. to some people. Definitely built by human hand. And I absolutely believe it was built as a giant resurrection machine for the great king Khufu, um, who was buried there. So this was, this was um, an age, we're talking about Old Kingdom, Egypt, uh, when there was a belief that 
really interestingly, a really ahead of its time belief that we now know to be in scientifically true that at a molecular level we are part of the universe, that there is nothing that separates us and every every atom of carbon within us and every, you know that we, we are part of a wider universe. And so for the ancient Egyptians, their great leader, King Khufu, this is suddenly this united Egypt, he has to rejoin the immortal stars for the world to keep turning. So it was the most complicated grave that's ever been invented and although it's been robbed I do believe that Khufu was buried in there what's really exciting as some of you have, I'm sure have seen is that there's um, a chamber in the pyramid and um, that has yet to be explored so there's an empty chamber above the king's chamber that might actually contain the body of King Khufu it could be that the burial chamber is a kind of decoy and we know all of this because there is so much new archaeology. And I just have to, I get incredibly overexcited about this, so I, so I just have to share. So there's a particular site that some of you might have heard of called um, Wadi al-Jaf, which is on the Red Sea. Um, it's been excavated. It was, it was discovered um, earlier in the 20th century, but it's been properly excavated since 2011. Being excavated as I speak... I mean, not quite, because they've probably gone to bed. But, right you know, now. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow morning, they'll, they'll be back out there. And Wadi al-Jaf are, um, are um, uh, man-made ports on the Red Sea, um, actually uh, constructed at the time of Sneferu, so Khufu's father, and built specifically, we think, to help import material, both for the kingdom, but also for the construction of the pyramids. And... Oh, my goodness, there are incredible things um, coming out of this site. So there are over 30 um, man-made caves, which were used as magazine stores. And because we're talking about Egypt, the, the levels of preservation are just incredible. So just have a look at some of these things. So these are all anchors, and on the anchors are written the names of the sailors who carried goods um, right across the Red Sea and up the Nile. So suddenly we, we know the names of the men who were involved in the building of the pyramid. Um, I don't know if you can make it out there. There are, as I said, ships, rope and planks from the boats. I mean, perfectly preserved. There are shoes of the sailors who, who worked to build the pyramid and contained within a number of these amphorae, the, the, the most extraordinary find of all, these papyri fragments. So over a thousand papyri fragments, and these are the oldest inscribed papyrus ever ever discovered, and they describe the building of the pyramid. So I mean, for archaeologists, it, you know, <laughs> it doesn't get better. So never say never as an archaeologist. You never know what's going to going to be revealed. And so what this is talking about is the kind of routine of particularly a man called Mera and his, his team of 40 um, sort of sailor labourers who work together to ship the materials, the raw materials, up and down the Nile to build the pyramid. So It's amazing to get this social history because we tend yes. to think of, well, as an outsider to the ancient world, I tend to think of it as, you know, kings, queens... Um, uh, pharaohs, but to, to have this social history is incredible. It's incredible, and it's really interesting. So the, these, these, um, the description of these teams, so there's Mera's team, but there are other teams as well, and they all have these kind of nicknames, like the hairy ones, or the Asian ones, or the lazy ones, and you really get this sense of this combined effort when they're kind of competing because for them it really mattered the building of the pyramid and I said this was this was a thing that kept their world turning and I have no doubt that many were press ganged into service um, we don't think it was built by people who could be actually qualified as the enslaved or slaves and I'm sure there were many who died in the in the creation of the pyramid and many who, who were forced to work there but we do get a sense from these papyri of of this this feeling of a kind of joint purpose so you know so it's the most um it's the most incredible discovery and this is just to show you this is how they're discovered i mean you know you, the, the archaeologists could just 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 kind of couldn't you know believe their eyes and i just wanted to put this in to show you the the kind of scale of the project, that this is where all the raw materials are coming from to, to create the pyramid. So somebody said it to me, it's brilliant, that it's the kind of biggest team building exercise <laughs> known, known in history. So yeah, no, it was, a, it, it was an, ex, an, an extraordinarily um, ambitious piece of work. And it didn't look as it looks now, I mean, to state the obvious. What would, it, what would it have looked like at the time from the outside? Yeah, so covered, I mean, it would have looked, I always think of it, you know, it would have looked like a sort of sci-fi, something that had fallen from space. 
because it was covered in, in highly polished, gleaming white mm -hmm. limestone with this um, electrum capstone, so this sort of you know capstone that would have uh, captured the rays of the sun. The River Nile was much closer to the base of the pyramid than it is today, because rivers meander, as we all remember from our O-level geography. But it was all, so, so the um, pyramid would have been reflected in the waters of the Nile when it flooded. So it would have been like this kind of double image. And actually, this brilliant work, both from uh, Mera's papyri and also from Mark Lerner and his team on the Giza Plateau, are, are working out that, that it's almost certainly hydrology. It's sort of hydraulic energy. So it's water. When the water flooded seven meters um, during the inundation, it's that energy from the water that's being used to raise those those limestone blocks into place. So it's very exciting. And this, I just had to put this in. So this is this is after I'd. Oh, actually, no, I think it is in there. I think it was like the week that the book went to the printers. You know, <laughs> they discovered this hidden corridor inside. The, so not just the chamber, but this 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 corridor. And I've got a friend who is sending a very, I call it his, I call, I call it his worm radar. He says that's really, it's a snake radar, which is apparently much, much cooler. <laughs> but it's something that he's using on, on the moon and he's going and exploring them. And they've, they're already discovering new, new cavities. Amazing. I mean, it's really, really cool. It's amazing. Yeah. So just given the, the, the number of hands that were up in the room for viewers listening at home or watching at home, um, I'm sure you were raising your hands as well. <laughs> there were a lot of hands. The Pyramid at Giza is fairly accessible. Yes. Lots of people see it. There are other wonders that aren't necessarily as easy to get to. Yes. Um, I'm thinking of the Hanging Gardens yes. of, of Babylon. So I know with your the research for your book, you did travel. You are a traveller. Mm. Bethany has a series on at the moment called Treasures of the World on Channel 4, if you want to watch it, where yes. she's travelling around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So... Could you tell me about could you tell me about the hanging gardens of Babylon the history yeah is that the most mysterious to me anyway yeah definitely and and you know I'm glad you do say about, about traveling because it's you know as a keep these are places that were traveled to and I've just got to before we go into hanging gardens I just want to show you these two little photos um, images because they're, they're they're my favorite this is from 1612 and I love it that in 1612 people were eagerly going and visiting the pyramid and very naughtily climbing to the top which uh, you know was recorded by Hans Brunning, whose book this was. It's really dangerous to go to the top, but people have done it, always done it. And even in 1938, they were climbing <laughs> to the top of the pyramid, having a lovely picnic on it. Um, and I'd love to, if anybody in the room or watching has got um, pictures, service women and men. It was something that, that people did a lot in the 20th century. There was a kind of dare to get up to the top of the pyramid. And I'm beginning to get in these amazing photos of people whose dads and granddads um, climbed to the top. But anyway. I did speak to an archaeologist once, actually. I won't name names who said that they'd actually climbed to the top as well. No way! Yeah. I don't think they did. I don't think they were allowed. Uh, they were definitely well, not allowed. Yeah. No, they were <laughs> wasn't part of an excavation. No, they were definitely not allowed. And there's, just to finish off on the travellers, one of my favourite um, women from history who, uh, you, you're a very cultured audience, so you might know, but she should be a household name. So this woman called Egeria. And Egeria travelled to the pyramid in the 4th century CE, we don't know whether she came from a sort of community of nuns in Portugal, so we don't know whether she was a nun or a, or a, or a lay sister, but she was travelling through the Holy Land. And she writes the most brilliant eyewitness accounts of the pyramids in the 4th century, which is still in print, which is why, you know, she should be a household name. But, and I sort of love her and I sort of hate her because, because she was travelling with this Christian kind of gloss and, and travelling to the Holy Land as a pilgrimage. She is the person who told the world that the pyramid was actually um, the granary of Joseph, which um, that you can see in St. Mark's Basilica um, throughout the medieval period. This is how it was represented as the granary of Joseph. So there's Joseph in front with a lovely sheaf of wheat and these little windows for the grain. So, so the issue with travellers is that we can all get a bit romantic with our travellers' tales and, you know, sometimes fake history gets inserted. You know, people may try to make sense of things that they've... a wonder, yeah. the things that they know. Yes. Um, and I think that's an interesting... Yeah, exactly. Interesting. And, and, and just so... so and, it, and it's really pertinent with your question about, about the Hanging Gardens because um, they're the only ones that we don't have absolutely certain hard evidence for their existence and for where they were, if they existed. I, I, act, I believe that they did exist, and you know, I'll explain why. Um, but at the moment, we don't have any... We can't, I couldn't go to one spot and say this is where the Hanging Gardens were. So, um, and, and there's a really interesting possibility that they could have been in Babylon, 
or they could have been 100 miles to the north in Nineveh, because there's also a candidate for hanging gardens in, in Nineveh. But they're, they're, what's really interesting about them, I've just got to show you this lovely, lovely image from the 7th century um, of beautiful, uh, terraced, well-watered gardens. This is actually in, um, in Nineveh, in Sennacherib's palace. Um, because we, they didn't survive, because if you think about it, nobody wants to look at a, get, a dead garden or remember a dead garden. There's something really spooky about that. So as soon as the planting failed, people stop writing about it. They start to write about it in a more kind of fantastical way. Um, but there are lots of very detailed accounts of how they were made. You know, the hanging thing, I sort of think of it as a series of giant um, window boxes, almost, uh, that were lined with bitumen. So this is what everybody tells us, that they were lined with this, the petrochemical of antiquity, stacked one on the other. And as you can see from this beautiful steely, which would have been originally, this has been recolored, but it would have originally been painted this kind of color. Um, palatial culture in the Iron Age loved a garden. They, they, the, the kings of the time were obsessed with gardens. And you know, there's a really interesting reason for that. So, so this is the Iron Age, and iron technology has been developed. And whereas when you look at um, the pharaohs and Egyptian culture, as I said, it's, it's all about mart, about you being a part of Mother Nature and Mother Earth and the universe. By the time you get iron, techno iron implements to farm with, we start to develop a narrative which is much more about us having dominion over the natural right. world. So this is when the book of Genesis is written, is set down, when we hear that man has dominion over, over nature. Um, it's around the time in the Greek world when you get Gaia, the goddess Gaia, saying that she wants to rid herself of the burden of humanity because, because humans are, are beginning to kind of destroy her beauty. And it's something you absolutely see in the, in the Hanging Gardens narrative because these great kings, so Nebuchadnezzar the Great, who's, who's the kind of prime candidate for, for having built the Hanging Gardens, for his, his wife who was homesick, who was missing her, the mountains, the Medean mountains that she'd been born into, or Sennacherib, who's slightly earlier in Assyria, as I said, 100 miles to the north. What they both do, they're, they're basically both kind of um, extreme gardeners. <laughs> like, I watched Gardener's World for the first time in about 25 years um, this weekend. It was so gentle, it was so lovely. And I was, I was suddenly imagining, you know, Nebuchadnezzar the Great and Sennacherib with Monty Don having a conversation <laughs> about, that, about their gardening because it's really fascinating. So these are, these are great rulers, as in, as in powerful, um, potent rulers, who um, take over territories, they, again, they enslave whole populations, but to really prove that they have power, they move whole forests from one place to another. And they boast about it. And I just, this is the only thing I want, I'd, I'd like to read out to you. So this is um, from the two steelies where we hear how Nebuchadnezzar the Great and Sennacherib um, feel about their extreme gardening. So this is Nebuchadnezzar. He says, Strong cedars, thick and tall, of splendid beauty, supreme their fitting appearance, huge yield of the Lebanon. I bundled them like reeds and I perfumed the river with them. I put them in Babylon like Euphrates poplars. And then Sennacherib says, I tore open mountain and valley with iron picks. I built palatial pavilions of gold, silver, bronze, alabaster, elephant tusk, and I decorated them with ebony, boxwood, rosewood, cedar, cypress, pine, elamaku wood, and Indian wood, beautiful trees for my royal abode. So, you know, it's really, really fascinating that this is a statement of power, as I said. It's not just that they can build, that they can shift the earth itself. Well, one of the, one of the big themes throughout your book is this notion of humans wanting to create and force the world into their own image. Yeah and the attempts to do so. I wonder if you could expand on that. Yeah. It's a basic hu human thing. Yeah, it is. It's sort of, we like to leave a mark, don't we? You know, that's certainly if you think, because it takes a lot of effort to do all this. You know, these are things that we don't have to do, but we kind of want to make an impression on the world. And, and we also, you know, again, it's not entirely negative. We want to enjoy them. So in these, in these beautiful palaces, we know that there were, they were kind of basically pleasure gardens. And there's another 
um, wonderful image from the time of people floating on these inflatable lilos. And again, I just have to show you, because this is one of my favourite photographs um, from the archive. Um, this is 19th century, uh, mid-19th century. I don't know if you can work out what you're looking at. So, so, so basically, these are giant lilos made of blown-up cows, of, of, of entire cows. And this, was, this photograph was taken in Afghanistan uh, in, I think, 1864. And the, this, these, this was a community who still travelled on the river on these giant lilies. It's like the, you know, the historical equivalent of those horrible blow-up crocodiles and sort of you know, pink pigs and flamingos and things you get in swimming pools. But we know from the steely evidence that they were using these these lilos in the from in the cows. from cows wow. in the gardens of Babylon, and we can't tell from the steely whether it's pure pleasure or whether it's a kind of military training exercise. But you know, we're we're nothing if not inventive as a species, um, and as you said, sort of wanting to make our mark. So if you look at these again, you'll all know these images: the the the, the walls of Babylon, very famous walls which sometimes end up being on the seven wonders list instead of the gardens themselves but I mean just you know look again this is 2550 years old and and yet it still maintained its color though so this is actually from Istanbul what I just showed you the, the Ishtar gate is in Berlin so it's sort of you know we, we, we want to replicate nature and oust nature and when when we're not happy not leaving make, making a mark on the world yeah yeah i think i think it's so interesting with with, with the um, hanging gardens of babylon i think for me personally the story of the search for them yes. is almost as interesting as the thing itself yes. yeah could you tell us a bit about the history of the archaeological searches for yeah well well there have been a lot and um you know ancient authors also went to to search for them and there's the issue of course because a lot of that material was mud brick so we know that so it's, it was it was a kind of organic mm. wonder so you've got uh, palaces part which are partly made of mud brick you've got as i said these giant kind of wooden containers lined with bitumen and then you've got earth and trees so the problem is you know that goes but but, the, but if you look at the excavations um, of Babylon, for instance, you know, the walls are coming out of the sands looking like this. You, it's just, if you look at the archaeological photos, it's, and, you, and actually you can see the, 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 the wonder on the faces of, of both the workers and those that were leading the digs. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, I'm, no, I'm aware of the time. I'm and we've still got We've still got five wonders to get through. <laughs> I think, I think if, you, if we don't get through all, there is a very good book on the side. <laughs> um, shall we turn to, well, is it your favourite one? The Temple of Artemis. Yeah. I think, you know, you shouldn't really have a favourite, should you? <laughs> um, but I think it might be. Um, I think it might be my favourite partly because it's the least well known and well done sir for popping it in there it's the one that people normally miss off the end interestingly they usually start with the hanging gardens of babylon that's that's even though we don't know whether it existed or not that's that's the sort of most popular and famous but the temple of artemis for some reason gets knocked off and i love it for lots of reasons i love it um because again it was so imposing so this is a temple there's be actually been a temple on the Ephesus site, um, probably dating back um, uh, at least to 1000, around 1000 BCE. So a sort of simple, probably wood-built temple. But as far as we know, the earliest stone-built temple was from 550 BCE. And it keeps on getting rebuilt and rebuilt because it's, frankly, a terrible place to build a temple because it's on um, uh, right the way on a, on a geoseismic line. So it's on, it's on a fault line. It's very, very marshy, so it's a place where there's a natural spring where sort of sweet water meets, meets the water of the sea. And so it kept on falling down. And if you look at the, how it's constructed, there was this sort of anti-earthquake engineering they put in of laying fleeces on the foundations and, and charcoal. But there just must have been something special about that, that site because the, the high priests and the city councils just refused to, to, to move it. Uh, th there are other places it could have been built uh, in higher ground, but they always kept it there. So I just love it because just is there something s a little bit special about that yeah. about that situation? I also love it because it was enormous. So the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, 
was twice the size of the Parthenon in Athens. And, you know, the Parthenon in Athens is pretty huge, and this was double the size, and it's sort of like the mothership of all Greek temples. So all Greek temples really took their lead from the Temple of Artemis. So I love it as this kind of originator. But I also love it because of who it was there to honour, and it was there to honour this incredible creature, the, the uh, Artemisian, uh, the Eastern Artemis, so the, the, the great Artemis of Ephesus. So this is um, a cult statue that was discovered at, at Ephesus, it's still in the Ephesus Museum. And, you know, if I say Artemis, the, the goddess of hunting, possibly what might come to mind is the kind of wafty Greek or Roman Diana version of a sort of pretty creature with little curly hair and sort of artfully shooting a bow. Look at this, look at this goddess. I mean, you know, boy is she ferocious. And I'm sure you're all too kind of polite to point out that she looks like she's got 30 or 40 breasts hanging from her, <laughs> from her chest. So she's known as the polymastic Artemis for that reason. Um, interestingly, they're not breasts. They obviously give the impression of breasts and that's no coincidence, but there are no <laughs> nipples. So there's a possibility that there are sacks of honey or even bulls testicles oh. Oh, wow. um, but whatever's going on the person who created this sculpture is telling us that Artemis has extraordinary power and and what we hear of is that Artemis was so potent she didn't need to have sex of any kind to reproduce she could just go kind of you know and uh, create all kinds of things which is uh, you know that's why she's a woman she's a woman not to be messed with Artemis and if you look at you know beneath the, the beautiful um, decorations beneath her there are kind of monsters and cows and goats and then on, on this figure here you can see there are images of the zodiac so she was sort of thought to be a, be a great creator and um, uh, she was so potent and so female that her, she had eunuch priests who attended her cult and she protected young virgins. So she was a protector of both hunters and of the hunted. And um, the Temple of Artemis, because of this, was a sanctuary. So all Greek temples are sanctuaries, but this really was a sanctuary. So, and it was a refugee sanctuary. Right. So it was somewhere where if you had just cause and if the high priestess accepted your plea, you were given sanctuary and there are these dormitories for refugees in the temple of artemis and i and i love the fact that the you know uh, you know the romans they're not my favorite <laughs> of all the ancients so the romans are the ones who really complain about all these refugees <laughs> they kind of say they're really mucking up our ephesus experience but but i just there's something very kind of beautiful about that idea that this is a place that you could go to a place that honored nature um, and the female as i said she's she was pretty ferocious um so there was also the, a, a huge um image of uh, the medusa of, of a gorgon above above the temple this is actually from corfu this is in the corfu museum um and it was made at almost exactly the same time as the one in in ephesus so i think it would have looked like that and i just to give you scale this is me and my best friend jane standing wow. underneath the um, underneath the pediment but you know so you'd really have known that you were as I said she was a creature not to be messed with um and i and i think it's really pertinent the fact that she gave sanctuary and you absolutely could not cross that sanctuary line and the only person that we know who actively did was queen cleopatra and Queen Cleopatra's sister, Arsinoe IV, fled to the Temple of Artemis and sought sanctuary and was given sanctuary and was, was um, uh, looked after by the priestesses and priests in the temple. And then Cleopatra paid for her to be dragged out and killed on the, on the steps. So, you know, even Artemis met her match, I think, in Cleopatra. But, but it was a sort of, it was a beautiful place, a lot of gold. So Croesus, the famous Croesus, when we say rich as Croesus, he was a real person and he dedicated gold to the sanctuary. We're told that he dedicated whole gold bulls, that he covered the columns in gold. And we find these beautiful little gold figurines. I love this sort of, I love her. So this sort of plump, plump cheeked. We don't know whether she's a priestess um, or an ordinary woman, but she was left for the goddess. As were all these images of hawks, because again, she's the goddess of hunting. So um, hawks were sacred to Artemis. So 
you get these golden hawks. So, so yeah, so you can tell I'm biased. I just kind of, I love, I would have loved, that's, I'd love to have gone to all of them, but I would really have loved to have gone to the, to the Temple of Artemis. No, it sounds beautiful, and these objects, they're extraordinary to see as yeah. well. But if we move from the fierce and ferocious female, yeah. let's move to the masculine now. Yes. With Zeus. Yes, king of the gods. King of the gods. So Zeus in his great temple in Olympia. Um, so the, the statue of Zeus, this is, this is actually not too bad, um, uh, a visualisation of the statue of Zeus. It was um, over 43 feet high, seated. You know, again, just imagine the impression it would have made. It, was, it, it used a tonne of gold and a tonne of hippopotamus ivory was used to create, um, and the hippopotamus ivory was used as the skin. And if you've ever seen ivory, it's really, I was clearing out uh, an old um, woman's house who, who had been a great friend of, of mine, and I found um, uh, an ivory bracelet, which obviously before ivory was yeah. found, and I've never seen it close up. And it's, if anybody has, it looks like it's alive. So it's got this extraordinary sort of patina in it. So if you can just imagine how that would have caught the, the light on the skin of, of Zeus, also decorated with these crystal flowers. What they've got completely wrong in this image is that there was a huge pool of olive oil underneath Zeus. So he'd have been reflected in this kind of oh, inf yeah. infinity pool. So he'd have looked, you know, double the size. So um, it, he, he represented everything that was in a way opposite to Artemis. He was all about competition, having no mercy, uh, you know, extreme individual activity, and, the, and with, I sort of immortalised this notion that failure was absolutely not an option. What, what happened to, to the statue? So, so the statue was um, taken to Constantinople and was then uh, taken into the palace of a eunuch called Lausos, and there was a terrible fire in 476 CE, and it was burnt to the ground. But it sort of survives. I'll just whisk through. So this is, I just put this in because I think it's extraordinary. So this is an image, obviously, of a person in a wheelchair from the time of the building of the, of the temple of um, Zeus at Olympia. And we've now realised that there are disability ramps at Olympia. So although we sort of imagine it was all about, you know, what they described as bodily perfection, actually it would, it would have been a very um, diverse um, audience there. And, you know, and it's really interesting that there are disability ramps actually into the temple itself. But the, you asked about the... Uh, what happened to the, to mm. the statue. So it went to, um, so, so I know it looks slightly random, I put up an image of Jesus here. So it went to Constantinople, and we know that the face of the statue of Zeus, which was said to thunder as if kind of thunder was crossing its brow, was used as a model in Byzantium, in Constantinople, for the, the images of, of Jesus. So whereas the very early images of Jesus are of this sort of, a boy that looks a bit like Alexander the Great, or Apollo, this sort of beardless youth. Um, later in, in Byzantium, it's um, Zeus becomes the, the, the model for uh, uh, Jesus Pantocrator, Jesus the, the creator of all. So interesting. We have still, well, we managed to get quite through quite a few then, actually. We do still have three, but we're short on time. So let's, let's go through them. Whiz through them. Let's whiz through them, <laughs> the wonders. OK. Um, the next one is the, and I'm going to make sure I pronounce this correctly, the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. Carnassus? Carnassus? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, if you could tell us a little yeah. bit about that. So, so the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. So the Mausoleum, um, probably my second favourite, again, because it was so nuts, this building. So this, I'll just show you, this is um, uh, the Lincoln Memorial in the US, um, again, based on the Statue of Zeus, this seated, this, this seated figure, but it's called a mausoleum after the mausoleum of Halicarnassus. So this was the original mausoleum. Um, it wouldn't have looked anything like this. It would have been brightly <laughs> painted. The, all the statues on it would have been this kind of, much more this kind of color. So it would have erupted like a kind of firework in, on the horizon. And I, again, I adore the mausoleum of Halicarnassus for, for many reasons. One is because it was actually built by a, a, by a woman, by a woman called Artemisia, so it should have been called the Artemisium of, yes. of Halicarnassus. I love it because it was built for a Carian king, and the Carians are a much neglected civilization of the ancient world. They were really interesting. They were mercenaries, fighters, kind of chancers, uh, adventurers, travelers. Uh, women were very strong. 
in Carian society. It was a bit weird, brothers and sisters married, so Artemisia oh. was Mausolus' wife and also his sister, but, you know, people did things differently then. Um, uh, but I just have to show you this, that when I was um, researching the book, I got a call when I was in Turkey, and somebody, uh, this, this, um, uh, somebody in the archaeological department said, uh, we've just unearthed a tomb also built by Mausolus. Would you like to yeah. come to see it? So, of course, I said, yes. And this is me extremely happy in the tomb <laughs> also built by Mausolus. And I just, I know that we're running out of time, but I just have to tell you this story. So this is an incredible thing. I mean, I'll just show you. I mean, it's the, the sophistication of the artwork is just exceptional. And this would have, this is what the mausoleum of Halicarnassus would originally have looked like because we know that Mausolus used the same artist. So if you just kind of look at the level of detail on that sarcophagus, and the only reason that we know it existed is because uh, there was a man in a pub in Scotland, and uh, he That's all good story <laughs> start, I know. I have to say. he had obviously had a, like four pints too many. And uh, he said he was talking to a friend, and he said, "You're never going to guess what I've got on the table in my kebab shop. I've got the most enormous gold crown." And unfortunately for him, there were two off-duty coppers in the pub <laughs> who also went, "How fascinating! Tell us, tell us more about this." And it turned out this guy was fencing this golden crown, which had been stolen from this from this tomb. And I know, great intake about it, it gets better. So um, a German academic had written a really, really arcane academic article in German about where he thought the lost tomb of Mausolus's father, Hecatomnus, who, this is whose tomb it was, was. And he thought it was under us in Marlassa, under a kind of particular temple. And somehow an organised crime gang <laughs> got, hold <of> this, <laughs> got hold of this article and thought, well, we'll have a bit of that. They bought the land above the tomb. For four years, they dug down into the bedrock. And at which point, you know, you're not telling me that everybody in the village wasn't in on the game because that is a big kitchen extension to be coming out with kind of <laughs> wheelbarrows of bedrock. And uh, they managed to get down into the tomb. And the, and the tragic thing is that the, because they were digging down, the final plug of the bedrock fell and smashed the, root, the lid of the, of the sarcophagus. Anyway, which is just, you know, unforgivable. And they, they took all of the treasure. And slowly, slowly, Interpol are getting it back. But that was the only reason that people knew that this tomb existed, because, because it had been robbed. So that tells you don't drink four pints in a in a in a in a pub wow. in Edinburgh. So I think I, if there are any film producers, Hollywood producers yeah, here, I know Bethany's book. Yeah. Um, definitely. Definitely. I amazing know. story. It is, it is. Um shall we go to the Colossus yes, of Rhodes? Yes, 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 yes. The Colossus of Rhodes. There we are. So the Colossus of Rhodes. Um, you know, if we say the Colossus, everybody will say it's this bronze figure straddling the harbour like this with um, boats going in and out of this. I just, again, had to show you this. I love the fact that um, early 19th century Japanese artists were imagining the Colossus of, the Colossus of Rhodes. I like the fact he's got a ball. He, look, sort of, he looks like, what does he look like? So Professor Brainstorm or something, doesn't he? It's kind of incredible, incredible image. Anyway, so I sorry to rain on your parade, but the Colossus definitely didn't straddle um, the harbour. Um, oh. That just wouldn't have worked in engineering terms. Uh, he, it was 108 foot high. It was an extraordinary sculpture. Um, and I think almost certainly it, w it was um, on the top of the old city of Rhodes. So if you sail into, the old, into Rhodes and look up at the old town, there would have been an optical illusion. It would have looked like it was straddling the harbours beneath. So I think, you know, that's that's where the idea came from. Although we actually know, again, one of these pesky travellers, it was um, an a, Italian lawyer in the 14th century who went to Rhodes, and he's the one who said it was straddling the harbour. Nobody had written that before, and it stuck as an idea. <laughs> so, so you know, it's an, it was an extraordinary, um, yeah, an extraordinary um, uh, statue. And built probably from the melted down siege engines and weapons that were used at, during a siege of roads. So it was, there's, there's a potential that it was something very beautiful, that it was actually a kind of symbol of the value of diplomacy after, after war. But you know, it's, it's definitely captured everyone's imagination. And again, this is, this is only if you are gamers, this is, in Mar this is the Colossus of Rhodes in Mars, God of War. Oh, really? <laughs> wow, mm. that's, um, that's interesting. I think the Colossus of Rhodes would be my, 
if I was asked the question, I think that would be second on my list after Hanging Gardens. Yes. And every, second most well known. And everybody remembers it because of the Colosseum. So, you know, the Colosseum is named after the Colossus. So, basically, Nero, who loved Greek, Greek culture, said, I want my own Colossus, of course. So he built it, and then Vespasian took over his Colossus, and then Hadrian moved it to outside the Flavia, to 124 elephants, or 24 elephants, I've got to remember, to move it outside what was the Flavian Amphitheatre. And um, we know that it then... Uh, the first time I actually hear of, of it being renamed the Colosseum was in around 1000 CE in a sort of travel guide to Rome. And by that time, this, the building was called the Colosseum after the colossal statue that stood outside it. So interesting. I think we might do it. I think we might yes. get through all seven. Yeah, maybe. Um, shall we go to the Lighthouse of Alexandria? Yes, yes. So the Lighthouse of Alexandria... Um, the only building that's not explicitly uh, religious in, in some way, which is interesting, and it still sort of exists. So there's me again looking very happy because I'm standing outside what, what was the footprint of the original lighthouse of Alexandria. Um, it's, it's an Ottoman period fort that's been built on it. But if you go there, and again, has anybody been to Alexandria? Have you been to the... A couple, yes. Yeah. So have you been to the... To, to here, yeah. So you'll know that if you go to its Cape Bay um, fortress, that some of the original stones from the Lighthouse of Alexandra are built into the fort. So if you want to go and pay homage and, you know, touch a stone from um, antiquity that, that would have meant so much to people, do go there. These beautiful red, uh, red granite from Aswan. And if you look over the sea, so I'll just give you a tip, if you stand on top of the fort and look with your back facing Alexandria to the right, then you can see some of the, the stones from the lighthouse are on the bottom of the seabed, and you can still see them. So incredible. So this was a staggering. This was 180 feet high. As, you know, it was a skyscraper, 180 feet high, um, with a, a flame that was lit eternally, uh, decorated with automata, so, you know, the most extraordinary construction. And it was so famous that they even wrote about it in China. So China describes the lighthouse of Alexandria. Um, and, you know, one of my favourite authors from antiquity, a man called Lucian of, of Samostata, really wicked sense of humour, who writes the world's first sci-fi novel, and he describes an ancient Greek astronaut who flies up into space and looks down and can see all these planets and doesn't know which is planet Earth. And then he spots the Colossus of Rhodes and the Lighthouse of Alexandria, and he knows that that's that that's a very very smart, very smart. So it's sort of <laughs> you know, so it came to kind of symbolise um, uh, humanity. I mean, that's you know, if you go to Alexandria again, the, the people who've been it's just and it's a beautiful wide bay. Just imagine what it would have looked like stretching up and the people who would have seen it you know Cleopatra would have walked past it every day when she was in Alexandria or looked at it from her from her palace so um how long how long do you take when you're filming and yes. you go to a site how long do the crew have to wait for you to just <laughs> take in the site? <laughs> no. I can imagine you're there for a while they do they do <laughs> and then the cameraman who's also my best friend will suddenly sneakily start filming so they, oh you know it looks it looks really natural no you have to you you have to just I mean it's you know it's so lucky to be able to visit these these places and experience them to experience them so yeah you know we we, we start our days are usually about 18 our days because we just want to spend as much as time as possible with the, with the artifacts. No, it's fantastic. Um, I'm going to open up to audience questions, so have a think. We have some hands going up already. Um, I think this gentleman at the front here. Um, also, if you're, if you're at home watching, please do send your questions in. I do have some here already, actually, as well. So um, if you want to ask your question first. Thank you. Um, Hello, uh, Professor Nerv, Bethany Hughes. Um, firstly, I just want to express my great appreciation considering the opportunity. Um, my question specifically concerns my fascination with the dichotomy between agency and information. I mean, uh, specifically within a world where information acquisition is seemingly unprecedented and where society and culture are each developing so rapidly through increased exposure to ideas, um, perhaps so often at times polarizing, that a concept known as negative capability within philosophy that contradictory concepts can coexist um, may seem remedial to now to these challenges. Acknowledging um, your unique experience and expertise within the humanities, um, notably history and its expression via pedagogy, what do you think is unique about the potency of the written word, particularly, 
and its meaning within communication and technology as society adapts to progressively considerable change uh, so significantly. Wow, amazing, amazing question. <laughs> so the kind of, thank you. So the kind of, basically the value and potency of the, of the written word, and it's a brilliant question, because uh, as we look at this image of the Lighthouse of Alexandria, you, you will probably know this, that the docking tacks at Alexandria were papyri with the written word on, and what they would ask for is they'd ask for the original, they'd copy it out, and they'd send a copy back. So you could only enter Alexandria if you brought writing with you, because this was a city that wanted to be the repository of all knowledge. It was the kind of internet of the day. So for the Hellenistic world, writing really, really, really mattered. But up until that point, it had been an oral society. And I look back at those earlier civilizations, and I don't think they're any lesser for not depending on writing in the same way that we do. You know, again, there's a revolution of writing in 5th century um, BC Athens, for instance, when democracy is invented. Because if you're going to have a democratic government, you have to communicate the laws that you want people to vote on. But I look, as I was saying, at you know, the Temple of Artemis in the 6th century, 100 years before, and I don't see... A lesser people. I don't see people who are less sympathetic. So I love writing. I spend my time writing. I love the beauty and transportability of the written word. But I don't think it's the only thing that gives us ideas, obviously. And if you look at the, you know, there's this wonderful phrase, the, the, the critical mass of the cognitive group, that what happens, change happens right the way back 70,000 years ago, when you get enough people who sit together and just chat about ideas. And Socrates, as you know, you know, is allergic to the to the written word. He he spoke his dialogues the whole time, and he has the most beautiful phrase, which again uh, you probably know, and a lot of you will know. He says the great, or he puts this into into Plato's dialogues, but it's, uh, this, um, this you can hear Socrates speaking when he says the problem about the written word is that it immediately becomes an orphan. It never has its father to protect it, meaning, and we've all been through that, that when you write something, you know what you mean, you put it out into the world and somebody misinterprets it or misuses it. And we're living in an age where that is happening to the power of X on our phones and in social media. So I love writing, but I prefer talking. It's a really, really good question. Really Thank good you. Question, yeah. I can see there are hands up. I'm going to go to an online question next. Um, Sophia asks, if you could elect an eighth ancient wonder. Oh, yes. Which is <gasps> yeah, so this is the, the eighth, eighth ancient wonder. You know, it's really hard. As I said, I, I, when I first started writing the book, I thought, oh, you know, I'm sort of in two minds. But I've ended up loving them all, thinking this is the perfect, the perfect list. But of course there were, of course there were others. I think, if anything, it might be a site which is, again, just being excavated which is basically going to rewrite our understanding of, of the story of humanity. And um, it's a place called Karahan Tepe, and it's right the way down in southeast Turkey, very close to the Syrian border. Um, only 1% of it has been excavated so far. Um, it's 11,500 years old. And it's, um, it, it's, it's basically a giant city, and this is a city thousands of years before we're supposed to have cities. And in the 1% that's been excavated, some of you might have seen, I, did, I put it into a programme that we did about Turkey. Um, it's, uh, so, so basically, you walk in, it's, something, it's about the same size as this room, and it's a giant penis chamber. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a chamber where there are 11 monumental penises, the sort of the size of columns, all overlooked by a man's face with this kind of porn star moustache and a snake <laughs> for, a, for a body. And it's obviously, there's obviously some kind of ritual that goes on there. So there's a sort of exit and entrance and there's kind of waterway. But, you know, what is happening? And what is the story of that world when we're all supposed to be drifting around, you know, in skins being hunter-gatherers? But we're not. We're building a, some big party city, uh, you know, <laughs> on the borders of Turkey and Syria. So I think, given that only 1% of it has been activated and it's, all, it's pretty spicy already, um, I think that will... That will probably end up being my eighth one. Very interesting <laughs> choice there, Bethany. Very interesting. Um, we take a question from the audience now. Let's go to this side. I can see someone with your hand yeah. up there. Hi. 
I just wanted to point out that great chunks of the mausoleum of Halicarnassus are in the British Museum. They are. If you go to the, the um, Legion's exhibition, and are too early, as I was today, yes. you wander, you turn right and go along a bit, and yes. there it is. Yes. Including, as I understand it, those gold wreaths that yes. you were talking about. Yes, yes, yes. So the gold wreaths, like the ones in Hecatomitus tomb, you're absolutely right. So there's a whole room dedicated to it. It's strange that not that many people end up there. It's slightly sort of off, off the beaten track. And you can see the steelies of Amazons, the Amazons fighting what could be Mausolus and Artemisia. So they were, they were, we were told that there was a, a sculpture of Artemisius, Artemisia and Mausolus riding a, a four-horse chariot on the top of the mausoleum, and it could be that those figures are there, and one of the horses is definitely there. And the sculpture is beautiful, isn't it? I mean, it is, it is extraordinary. You can see the kind of uh, flexing veins on the horse's neck. So, yes, you can go and see. And you can also see bits of it built into the castle of St Peter's at Bodrum, um, so, tragically, huge amounts of it was ground down for lime by the Knights Crusaders when they were building their castle, but they thought it was worth keeping a few of the, the carved steely, so you can see some of those still, um, yeah, in, in Bodrum. But it's a, it's a, I would say go if you can, if you can go to Bodrum is modern day Halicarnassus, because you still get a sense of the scale of it, and you can see the steps that went down to the to the burial place, and yeah. Anna said then go and see some of the some of the sphinxes um, and some of the steely that would originally adorned it. Oh. Yeah. Think about my summer holidays. Um, <laughs> we'll take a question from this side. I can see a gentleman in the middle there. Oh. <laughs> or I mean, snatched from you at the back. <laughs> we'll get to you next. <laughs> we'll get to you next. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, one thing that seems common uh, amongst all the seven wonders plus uh, most of the modern wonders is the extraordinary level of human suffering yeah. and um, exploitation. Yeah. Now, as an optimist, I like to think that we um, will get to a point where we can create a wonder uh, without that level of suffering. But yeah. would that, in your view, be a complete break with human history? That has that has a wonder ever been created uh, in a completely benign way so far? And I if think we do, then will we be sort of doing something which is superhuman with regards to what we've seen historically? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't that be a beautiful thing? So that would be. It's really interesting that you say that. And this is somebody who's asking, what would be the eight, what would be a wonder today? What would be an eighth wonder? And actually, I mean, this is sort of slightly going off 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 topic but we decided that the NHS at its best is a wonder of the world you know something which is created with completely benign purpose and it would be you're right there was there was definitely suffering and there was definitely loss of life but I like you I'm an optimist and I'm hopeful and I also think that we shouldn't just think about them as monuments of exploitation because if you look at the sculpt of the of the beauty of some of the artwork I do hope that some of those craftspeople got pleasure out of what they were doing, that there was a kind of sense. And when they write about it, the art, you get these artists talking about this incredible opportunity that they have to travel from one city to another in order to get work on the masonry. So I think you're right. You can't, And I do write about that in, in the book, that we should never think about these things with roast. And I always have a moment. You were just talking about when, when you go to visit sites. I always stop and have a moment and think about the people who lost their lives and suffered in the creation of them. But I do also think that the making of them will have brought pleasure to some of those artisans and craftspeople who worked on them too. But let's let's join together. Let's do it. Make let's make an eighth wonder that is done without any suffering. That's a beautiful. Surely we can do it. You know, a kind of a, a wonder of positivity. It would be that would be an incredible thing. Just Here's a wonder. Yeah, yeah. You you had the mic sm snatched from me before. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask, you mentioned in the beginning that it, it would have been potentially reasonable to go visit all of them. And I wonder if there's any evidence or if you think that tourism was a motivator. I mean, yes. you mentioned that all of them are mostly religious, maybe except for this one. So yeah. was that kind of a competition to actually bring people to come see the wonder? 100% definitely. They were definitely tourist attractions. So some of the wonder lists, 
So there's um, a particular man called Antipater of Sidon, another called the Pseudo Philo of Byzantium. And if you read the lists, they're travel guides. I mean, then they actually say, don't stop at this particular harbour in Rhodes because you'll get all your cases nicked, you know, and there are pirates around that bay. So, they, so they're really practical guides. And we also, of course, it was a great money-making um, exercise. So we know that, um, interestingly, weirdly, um, we have this evidence from a couple of lines in the uh, Bible, in the New Testament, because we know that Paul went to Ephesus famously, and the Ephesians were really cross about him coming because they said, great is the Artemis of Ephesus. And they were particularly cross because you used to be able to go and buy little, like you go and get little Eiffel Towers or little, you know, Big Bends. People would go and buy little, little metal versions of the Temple of Artemis. And the silversmiths thought, if this poor guy comes along and says that Artemis doesn't exist, we're not going to have, we're not going to be able to make little Jesuses. So that was one of the reasons that he was attacked and drummed out of town by the silversmiths who are anxious about their souvenir trade going belly up. So, so yes, so absolutely, tourism was definitely a part of it, and there were people, as ever, who made money out of those travellers and, and pilgrims who, who went. And I think as some were just travellers. Some, some didn't, didn't go as pilgrims. They just went as tourists. Um, I'm going to go to a question from online. Yeah. Um, this, this question relates to the Temple of Artemis and whether the Temple of Artemis links to her twin brother's ancient site at Delphi. Yes. Was, was that a similar in the sense of being a sanctuary as well? Yes. So Apollo, so Artemis's twin brother is Apollo. So she's the goddess of the moon. He's the god of the sun. And the story was that they were born um, on, on the island of Delos. There's another version of that myth, which is actually that they were born in a grove next to Ephesus, oh. which is really... And, and, um, they were said to be born in this sort of Artigian grove next to Ephesus and that the Amazonian women came and helped with the birth. And that's one of the reasons that Amazons are so connected to the Temple of Artemis. So, yes, so there are temples of Apollo that, that match the Temple of Artemis, but none of them are as big as Artemis's <laughs> temple. She definitely won out. <laughs> Any other questions? I can see a gentleman there with his hand up. If I, if I am missing you, and if you've had your hand up several times, please wave, and then I'll see, I can see. Yeah. I... Thank you. Okay. Hello. Um, back to a practical question. Yeah. You've previously written also about Athena at the Parthenon. Yes. Also covered in hippopotamus ivory. Yeah. Was hippopotamus ivory reserved for wonders? Yes. What was underneath, and how on earth do they fix it? to what's under uh, uh, you list that again most brilliant question so hippopotamus ivory if you can imagine that is you have to kill a lot of hippopotamus to get uh, enough hippopotamus ivory so it was really expensive so it was reserved for divine figures and for wonders and, uh, and a lot of it came from up the nile um from africa and um the, basically you have kind of wooden substructures underneath both that athena and the the statue of zeus and there's an amazing academic who's done a living archaeology and worked out how how and you you it's really 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 difficult but you um you heat it you heat the ivory so you can curve it and when you heat it and add a kind of beeswax mixture you basically can it also immediately becomes self-adhesive and then you stick it and it cools and the ivory then clings onto the wooden base but just imagine the room for error you know, it's just ex extraordinary. So, and there are little chips of this ivory. The Phidias was the architect who built the statue, and he had a workshop at Olympia, and little tiny, tiny chips of hippopotamus ivory being found found in his studio when he was obviously practicing um, with what to do. But so, yeah. So it's a really good question, and it's really complicated. And again, those must have been just to your point, uh, you know, master hippopotamus ivory artisans who had this very, very particular skill. Thank you to this lady here. Um, it's been fascinating listening to you. Uh -huh. well, one of the things I'm interested in is that there's quite extraordinary um, sort of structures, and it touches on the last gentleman's question. Do we have any record or evidence of the technology behind building these things? So how did they get something that's you know, 400 feet yeah. high or 180 feet high when 
we can't, I, I suppose we can't conceive of how they will have done that yeah. with the the more basic technology, or we assume they had basic technology, I guess. Yes. But do we have any evidence or records of what technology was used to build all of these buildings? Yeah. Well, I mean, again, it's, it's tiny, tiny, tiny fragments of information. So inside one of the chambers of the Great Pyramid, um, you've got um, sort of a bit of maths done in red ochre, and there's something very similar in the Temple of Apollo, interestingly, at Didyma, where um, an architect has used, has actually kind of scratched um, a, a kind of geometry sum into, into a, a bit of the stonework. But the problem for us is that a lot of those calculations would have been just done on earth. So it would have just been done with sticks, you know, people sitting and kind of scratching out in the sand. So we don't have that. But we do have descriptions of the materials that they used, of the instruments that they used. Some of the instruments have survived. Uh, but it was incredibly simple. As I said, it was basically... Basically, com a compass and a flat rule. That's what they had. But, but to your point at the beginning, they must have had a lot of brain-sparking, inspiring conversations about how to solve how to solve those problems. And there is a terrible story about the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus that the architect um, was so just couldn't work out how to raise the lintel, so he he killed himself because he just thought he wasn't up to the job and then Artemis took pity on him and raised it, raised it herself kind of magically overnight. But I kind of, you know, it's really interesting that I kind of, almost like you're talking about the socials, you love that detail of there must have been guys like, I can't, I can't do it, you know, this is impossible and some, some horrible overbearing high priest going, it has to be bigger, you know, it has to be, the, the columns have to be taller. So, um, so yeah, so we do, we can jigsaw puzzle together some of that story but a lot of it, it has been lost because it was, as I said, literally just scratched in the sand or, or left on organic material. Um, I think we've got time maybe for one, one more question in, from the audience, but I just want to stress that Bethany Sorry. will be signing books at the end, so if you do have questions, you're happy yes. to answer them then, or if you, you don't feel comfortable asking them here, then you can. I can see a um, girl over there. Yeah. Um, if you could go back in time and visit one of the wonders... Um, in the time that it was like visited, which one would you choose? Yeah, what a brilliant question. So, um, oh, you know, am I allowed to say two? Is that I know, I know, I know that's a, I know that's a bit of a cheat. Um, I would have loved to have visited the pyramid because wouldn't it be interesting to be all that time ago and all that beautiful golds and the paintings and the artworks that have survived from ancient Egypt. So we know what their world looks like and we do know a little bit about what their world sounded like because we see some of the instruments that have been painted on the tombs and we can kind of work that out. But what would it have felt like? You know, I, can you just imagine what was, what was their world view? What did they think about when they looked at the stars? So I would love to go back to, to ancient Egypt. But I think where I'd have gone and stayed would have been the Temple of Artemis. Because <laughs> she's a cool woman, Artemis. I could have asked for sanctuary, hope that somebody didn't slip my throat on the, on the steps. And actually, because she was a protector of the hunted, as well as hunters, we think that there was this beautiful sort of um, wild animal park around the temple where they had deers and things and I love an animal so so I'd have gone and hung out with some of the deer in the in the temple but yeah come with me if I managed to if I managed to go do you know which one you'd have liked to have gone back to temple of Artemis fantastic we'll go together um, that was a, a lovely question. I think maybe that a, a good yeah. question to, to end to end the um, yeah. the event on. But thank you so much, Bethany. Thank you, audience, for your brilliant questions. Yeah. But thank you to you for. Oh, and thank, thank you, you Rebecca. Oh, thank you. Oh, well done. Well done. Thank you so much.